Um, I started my company in 87, and record stores have been our bread and butter. That's what we've always done. And as things happen, uh, people would say, we do this. Well, then yes, we do. We'll find a place to do it, and we went into it. Do uh, you also do shredding? Yes, we did. We bought a shredder, and we're in that also. So those are my three things. I mean, I'm, I'm a typical commercial record center involving um, record storage and shredding. Um, we have been on a fast track. My company has done really well. Uh, we were an E500 company in 1994. Um, we had more than 100% growth for five years in a row. I mean, we really had some serious good stuff to happen to us. Uh, Small Business of the Year, Future 50 company in Nashville. We won all the awards. We were, we were pretty much a darling in the media. Um, whenever I'm a, I'm a, I've got a degree in journalism, so when they wanted an article, they knew they could get a real easy one for me. I would practically give them the article the way I knew I wanted it done, and they could take it the way I gave it to them, and I always pretty well got my article. In fact, that still happens even today. That, that was one of the good things of having a really good journalism degree. I mean, that, think about getting that. It wasn't very a good choice, but anyway, I had it. Um, if you know anything about the record storage business, we've had, well, actually, we've had several fires lately, but uh, the very first one that, 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 that we know about, that everybody talked about, was the, uh, and it wasn't underground vault and storage. It was another mine in Kansas. And it started, the fire started in 1991, 650 feet down in a salt mine. And it was put out in 1992. It took them a year. And the way they put it out, it was so busy. They could not put any water in because that would have ruined the integrity of the salt mine. So they just pumped, um, and they sealed it up and let it burn itself out. And after a year, a half a million boxes had burned. It's a big mess. That's probably the, the, the one that I remember first. Um, if there were other small fires in the industry, nobody really talked about them, nobody ever mentioned them. Uh, 94, 95, 96, you had uh, Diversified in Philadelphia, you had Brambles in Chicago, you had Iron Mountain in Jersey, and then in 19, uh, May the, no, June the 18th, 1998, you had Richards and Richards in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, all those other fires were half a million, 250,000, 500,000, a million, 500,000, big fires, total building loss. Um, my fire was, uh, at the time, I had five buildings, and the building that caught on fire was, um, I'm trying to think how big that thing was, 40,000 square feet, um, and it was three-story. Um, bottom floor caught on fire, no, excuse me, second floor caught on fire. The reason my building caught on fire was we had a bum that broke into a building next to us at about lunchtime, started the lunch or dinner or whatever he was eating, and uh, it got out, of, got out of hand, it caught that building on fire, and that fire jumped over to my building. Now, I want you to understand that, and this is about the right amount of space, that's where my building is, second floor, and it had glass on all the way across the, the bottom floor didn't have any, uh, didn't have any, uh, it had nothing but brick. Second floor had glass up there, and it had windows about this size. It had uh, the, the, the big, thick glass with a steel, you know, in there, steel mesh. Uh, the fire started over here, but from over here to over there, the, the heat went all the way through that glass and caught boxes on the second floor on fire. Now, um, the interesting thing was that uh, one of my largest clients was Willis Caroon at the time. And Willis Crew came over and they said, we want to store, see where our boxes are. And they saw it and they said, man, this is great. You're fine. You know, you've got the steel mesh. There's no way. The, the fire's going to jump. And we were in concrete buildings everywhere we were. Every building that we had was a solid concrete building. We didn't have, even when we were up against somebody, we had, we bricked up things. But in this place, we had six or seven windows along there. But they said, no, there's too much distance. You won't have to worry about it. When we got the, the fire, when we got the call that the building was on fire, I, I drove down there. I was the first person on the scene. Um, and when I got there, I mean, we already instituted our disaster recovery plan. Um, and I did have a disaster recovery team, still do today. Uh, the interesting thing is that's 20 people in my company. That's almost most of my company. Everybody had a function to do. And we immediately turned it on and it worked. But uh, by the time I got there, I, I went down and looked and I said, well, there's no penetrations. And I called everybody back in the company and said, don't come down. We, you know, we're okay. There's a massive fire. This building is burning next door to us. But we weren't on fire. But after about 30 minutes, the fire marshal, I mean the, the fire chief, literally the fire chief of National Bob Dozier came up to me and said, Steve, we've got a problem. He walked me around and he looked in and we could see in the window there was fire in my record center. Well, we turned the disaster recovery plan back on and, 
and we did call, and BMS was notified, a, a black and orange schematic was notified very quickly. Um, within 30 minutes, I had somebody in Atlanta, Georgia, already in route for Nashville. The next morning, um, we had 57 people on site for BMS. Now, those guys were good. I'll tell you, they, they, were, they were fantastic, and I, I can't say enough good about that company. Um, let me take you back a couple of years, though. Um, you know, I told you we had those fires, and, and Prism Conference had been very good about talking about those fires. In fact, the year before, uh, at, uh, at the conference in Battle Harbor, Florida, Richard Reese talked about that million box fire, and, and uh, the Brambles president was up there, and he talked about his fire. It was really informative, very instructive. And the one thing that I remember, John, I don't know if you remember this guy saying this or not, but the first thing he said was really just caught my attention. He said, well, I don't know about you guys, but my insurance sucked. And I mean, I thought, you said that in front of 3,000 people, and, and they kind of joked about it, but he's right. He didn't have any insurance. When he said that, I thought, okay, what well, he's got sucked. What have I got? Well, then they went on to tell you the, the problems that they had. And they gave you a sheet when you walked out that door and said, here are the things you're going to need to be looking at. Well, I took that sheet back to my insurance agent. My insurance agent is like your insurance agent, is like yours, is like yours. He knows more about your dog and your wife and your business and everything else about you than he does. Maybe your golf score that he does about what your business does and what's the necessity of what, what the things that, that you need to be insured for your business. I promise you, 80% of the people in this room are not very well covered for what, what happened to us. And I am covered. I'll tell you that right now. I am covered. I'm, I'm going to tell you how I did that. Um, I took that sheet back to my agent and I told him, and this was June, this is probably May right after the conference, my insurance was on a calendar year and I said, guys, I want to review my policy. I have seen what's happened and I want to make sure that I am not in that group. I called um, a good friend of mine by the name, the name of Eric Tanner, who had just sold his company, I think, to, to recall. Maybe he hadn't sold by that time, I'm not sure, but Eric had had a, a fire in a building next to his. And I said, what are the problems that you had? Tell me what you had. And then I also went to, uh, I went to back to that sheet that they had given us at the conference, and I gave it to my agent, and I said, we've got to do something different. He said, you know, this is June. It's going to take me some time to generate this. Your, your policy renews in January. Let's, I'm going to be working on this for the next six months, and in January we're going to come up with a new policy. Well, he walks in in December, gives me a new manual, and says, here it is. And I said, did you? Do everything that I told you to do about this. And he had forgotten. Well, he then went back, and then a month later, he walked back in, and he said, this does do what you need done. You have got great coverage. That's January of 1996. Excuse me, January of 1998. Fast forward to June, June 18, 1998, about 7 o'clock. He is standing up there watching my building burn with his arm around me. We're both crying. It's very... Very emotional. It's still very emotional for me right now to think about that. Um, I can tell you that uh, he put his arm around me and said, you know, I'm so glad we did this back what we did in January. You've got a great policy. We're going to take good care of you. Now, people heard that. And then about 30 minutes later, we're standing over. He comes up and does it again. Different crew of people standing around him. And he says, you know, we are uh, this insurance company's largest rider of this policy in Tennessee. And I can tell you, you're, you are going to be so well taken care of. He said it in front of another group of people. And then he left. In fact, he left and he went on vacation. He left his dad in charge of the situation. Friday comes. And you better believe uh, you know, the, the press is hitting me. I'm, I'm having to do a lot of, just a lot of work. BMS, Black and Orange Static, the restoration, restoration company is there. And they're trying to figure out how to do this. I've got to sign all these documents. And, you know, I, you know, I just heard what my insurance agent said. I'm covered. I'm in great shape. Um, I felt very comfortable signing that work order saying, let's go. We're going to spend about a million dollars here very quickly. And I'm not exaggerating. It was about a million dollars very quickly. Steve, yes, I don't how many boxes were involved. Good, good point. Um, in that building, I had about 120,000 cubic feet in that one building. Three floors. First floor sustained water damage because the fire was on the second floor, and that's where the firemen were in there pumping the water. Um, the third floor sustained only smoke damage, so 120,000 boxes affected. 16,500 boxes were water damaged. 3,000 boxes burned. Two, actually, 2,800 boxes burned, that's all. 
Now, the reality is, uh, Richard Reese made a statement, and I would tell you the same thing you said, let those boxes burn. Because the 16,500 that were there were the ones that caused the most trouble because you got to get them freeze dried. Uh, and they were the trouble ones. The smoke damage ones, it's only two bucks a box, basically, to, the, to get that done. 89,500 were actually smoke damaged. We ozone them. They came out perfect. 16,500, I will tell you this, the wet ones, that is great technology. There was, I bet you there wasn't but maybe two boxes where somebody said, you know, I can tell that this was a wet box. Most of these boxes came back and people would say, I thought you said this thing had been freeze dried. Well, it had been. It's just that they have great, great, tech, great technology. Now, the, the way it improved was because of the Iron Mountain Fire, the Randall's Fire, Diversify Fire. They had improved their technology because of that. So that's I benefited from that. By the way, after my fire, London, 500,000 cubic feet. Uh, France, uh, 500,000 cubic feet. Four times mountains had that, that big one in London. Two in one in London, one in Quebec. Um, the night of the fire, my insurance agents told me I'm in great shape. I'm going to fast forward all this. I'm not going to go through all the gruesome details with you. Um, five days after the fire, I have already spent a bunch of money. And my insurance company calls and says, uh, Mr. Richards, you have got a great policy, but it doesn't cover anything having to do with records. And I, and I said, um, well, okay, I'm going to make sure this is correct here now. What do you think I do for a living? He said, well, I don't know, but... Um, um, you got a great policy, and don't worry, it's going to take care of anything, but anything having to do with records. I said, well, you know, it's funny you don't know what I do for living. You store your records with me. I've got all your corporate records here right now. And he said, look, don't get upset. You've got a great policy. It covered, and here's the last thing I said to him before I hung up and called my attorney. I said, so in other words, if I am Jim Reed Chevrolet, and you've insured every Chevrolet on my lot. You're going, you've written me a policy that covers every car on my lot of GM products. Is that about right? And that's what I said to him. And he said, Steve, don't get worried about this. You have got a great policy. And he wrote me a great policy that didn't cover anything I did for a living. Nothing. I mean, it covered some of my shelving. The only problem was my shelving was used. Um, so it, was, it, it really was nothing. The fast forward here, did you have a question, Chad? No. Okay. It's okay, I'll let you scratch it. Just, just scratch it. I won't do that. It's been a long day. <laughs> um, well, I'm just about done here. So, no, not what you're saying. Um, the, um, the, the big thing that happened was that um, this insurance company really, I think, acted truthfully. Uh, my agent is the one that did a very bad job. And my agent is the one that I know really well. Knows my family, knows everything about us. Knows my dogs and things and everything. We don't, we're not friends anymore, by the way, because I sued him and I won. In fact, I won big. I won bigger than, than what I've heard has ever been won. The problem is, is that um, I had a $2.4 million loss. Um, I said, look, I know I must have made some mistakes in this. You made some mistakes. I'm going to split it down the middle. I want you to pay me $1.2 million. And they said, well, we're going to give you 100000 And that's where we went to the lawsuit. Now, they didn't give me my $1.2 million. So who won in this case? It wasn't me. I mean, I was not made whole. Insurance is not going to make you whole. I can tell you right now, it's not going to happen. So you need to figure that it's it's not going to be a thing where you think you can you can survive this and you will be okay. Um, you know, we're you know, I'm, you know, I'm back. You know, I'm going to fast forward some more. We're back up. I mean, we've paid everybody off. We paid BMS. They were the very last people that we paid. They were very generous with us. Um, and we're back into normal operating condition right now, but um, we so, did not so have. How long did that take to get back to? Normal? Seven years. It's been seven years. It happened in '98, and this is this is '06. Lawsuit took seven years to, to finish up. We it was just January of last year that we actually settled that case. And they had to write me a, a much bigger check. But all I did was pay bills of people that that I already you know already, already been that, that had allowed me to write them for this long. And they all said we'll wait, and and they were very good to me. Question. I was going to ask why it took seven years. And well, look, this is a big insurance company. I'm a small guy. And they have great ways of dragging you. If they wanted me to die, I can assure you. They would prefer that I die sometime in that process. But, it, but, but you we, operationally go <coughs> up and running sooner than seven years. I was operating, no, I was operating the next day. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you the funnier thing, too. I'm going to tell you a little side thing here. This is very important, guys. 
Um, I can't tell you how well this thing came about. Um, the news are there. I have 150 firemen. I have 18 pieces of equipment surrounding my building. Uh, and it's downtown National People are leaving at 5 o'clock, so it's very well seen in the public. In fact, the way I was told, Jerry, my partner, calls me and says, Steve, Denise, his wife, just saw this on Channel 5. Our building's on fire uh, at McGap. And I said, that's impossible. And uh, he said, well, all I know is she said it's on fire. And um, so I, I ran down and that's that. And I'm only 12 blocks away. Everybody else is, I'm still working. Everybody else is at home. I run down there. And that's when I saw that it wasn't us. It was the shed next to us. Um, that night, the press showed up. And the press stayed there all night. They were there until about 11 o'clock. It was a big fire. Um, at the very first, I avoided them like the plague because this building had on it Ambassador Furniture Rental. And I thought, man, I'm covered. It doesn't say Richards and Richards anywhere on there. That's great. But somebody pointed me out, and they said, well, he's the whatever. And he said, are you the president? So one of the reporters came to me and said, are you the president of Ambassador Furniture Rental? I said, no. <laughs> Not honest answer. And then, uh, and then they came back later, and they said, are you the owner of the building? And I said, no. And so I dodged twice. And about that time, uh, oh, I guess about 30 minutes, the owner of the building showed up. Turns out he was the press secretary for Senator Bill Brock. And uh, he was a press secretary. And I'm a journalism person. He said, you are being crucified on Channel 2 right now, just so you know that. And they were talking about, you know, I don't know what they were talking about, but, but you know, we went up there and, and just started listening. And they were live showing my, burnt, my building in the fire. Here's what this, this friend of mine who owned the building told me I needed to do. He coached me on what to say. Um, he said, whenever they try to frame you and put the fire in the background, move. Just keep on moving. So you're doing this. So that finally, the, the, the camera will give up and you keep on moving away so you're not in the camera. You don't want them showing your fire in the, in the TV. And that's one of the things that he taught me. Second thing was, seven second sound box. You're going to say things that are going to keep the emphasis off of the fire. And um, he coached me on several of those things. So while Channel 2, 4, 5, and, and one radio station were up there live, I started going up and tapping on the shoulder live while they were recording. And I said, uh, look, I'm Steve Richards. I'm the president of Richard Richards. You probably need to be talking to me. And I interrupted a live, a live broadcast. And they said, well, oh, okay. Well, then I noticed the camera. There he goes. He's framing me right. So then I start moving. And they're, and they're trying to move. And they said, just stand right there. I said, okay. So then I keep on moving. Here's what I said, though. They wanted to ask about the fire. And I said, let me talk about the fire. And let me tell you what's going to happen in the morning. I'm going to have Blackman Morning Stomatic here. And we're going to start taking these boxes. And we're going to put them in a freezer tray. We're going to take them down and freeze those. And, and we're going to stabilize them. And then we're going to take them and freeze dry. Freeze dry is a process where you take water out. It was no longer a story about fire, folks. It was about a freeze dry process. And all of a sudden, there was a story there. And it completely took the emphasis off. And we, we were just trying to deflect at that point. Now, here's the, here's the end result of what happened the next day. The next day, uh, Friday, three people called me, three different people called me and said, we want to talk to you about records, George. And I, I mean, I don't, I mean, I was almost tearful. I said, well, no, you need to understand, I had a fire last night. He said, well, no, we know you had a fire. We saw a way from talking about three times. Man, that sounded really good. We wanted to talk to you about some records, George. We got three new clients on Friday the next day, only because... We tried to de-emphasize the fire and talk about what we were going to do to recover. And we did have a good recovery, folks. VMS did a great job. Uh, I cannot say anything, but they took that fire and managed it. And then they took the recovery and managed the recovery that allowed me to manage the business and, and the clients and all those things. And, you know, I can talk about that. That's a, that's a real full hour about how we manage contacting clients. And we didn't lose any clients in the process. We had some that got mad at us. But once they saw, look, we're, we're, going to be, we're going to be fair about this. We didn't raise our rates. We didn't do any things that somebody could have done. Uh, we were fair with everybody. We didn't add anything to it. If we freeze drive, we had any charge we needed to add any administrative fees. It cost me out the nose to do that, folks. But I knew in the long run, you have to do that. Um, let's get back to this whole thing about the insurance. Um, we contacted the lawyer immediately. We no longer had a relationship with an insurance agent. And uh, the lawyer started the process, which eventually took seven years. 
But the problem, the smartest thing that we did, uh, Richard Reese called me on Monday, and Fires on Friday called me on Monday. He said, you're going to have these five problems, blah, 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 blah. And I said, Richard, I know these guys really well. That's not going to happen. I don't want to let you know within 48 hours, all five of them happened. I mean, he, he had nailed it. And they were absolutely right. One of the things he said to do was, two of the things he said to do was, I'm going to make available to you my, my claims person. Um, and that's the, the Iron Mountain claims person. And she went in and said, I want to see this, this, and this. Um, and I mean, they, they really helped me in, in many, many, many ways. Uh, the second thing that they did was they said, you need to get a private adjuster to look at what you're doing. So immediately we went out and, and we actually interviewed the, the, the private adjuster for our mountain, but we chose somebody else. And only because that private adjuster, as it turned out 30 years ago, married one of my neighbors. And that neighbor was best friends with my sister-in-law. And you see how this thing happens. This is one of the Tennessee stories here. We're not related, but... Brother and sister. Very so anyway, Jerry Bratcher, it turns out, I, I, my, my brother, my older brother who owns another company in Nashville, I, I told him, I, I've, I've, inter I've interviewed three people, private adjusters, this guy, this guy, and this guy. He said, Jerry Bratcher? He said, you know, it's funny, I knew a Jerry Bratcher from Nashville and something about Memphis and Ole Miss. And I said, well, Jerry, he said he went to Ole Miss, and he's about your age. And he was driving back to Atlanta, Jerry Bratcher was. And I called him back, and I said, are you the Jerry Bratcher that married Linda DeLugge? And he said, well, yes, I am. And I said, well, golly, I used to play with Phil, and Francis and I went to junior high, and, and Linda was best friends with Trish, Trish Richards, I know Trish. So all of a sudden, there we had our private adjustment. Project. That's, that's the way it happened. Um, I'll tell you this, Jerry learned the industry very well. It's a country right? western, so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's one in there somewhere, I promise. <laughs> um, so, my story to you is... Um, if you think you have got good coverage, you probably really don't. And the way to tell it is not to ask your agent. Um, I would suggest very strongly that you hire a private adjuster. And I'll give you Jerry Bratcher's name. He has his own firm in Atlanta. And, and let me tell you the reason why. We, one of the things that we make the biggest mistake on in the, in the vault business, in the record stores business, in the uh, destruction business, is that we all have one insurance agent. There's 400 of us. We need to have 400 of us using one guy because that one guy is going to be very beholden to this industry. And I think that's one of the critical mistakes that we're making so we don't do that. Um, now, Jerry Brasher will look at your insurance policy and tell you what you've got. That's all he does for a living. If you have a claim, he will go... Um, so let, let, let me back up. If you have a claim, I want you to understand that your insurance, company, your insurance company and your insurance agent hate your guts and they want you to die. The way they make their money is to keep your money. They don't want to pay you back. That's the way they make their money. So you immediately have nobody on your side unless you hire an attorney. And an attorney is not an insurance agent. Unless you're lucky you have one that really knows insurance law. But he's going to be very expensive. A private adjuster does nothing but read insurance policies and make sure that your insurance set does exactly what you need it to do. And he will interpret it for you, and he'll go in and he'll get you money. In fact, the, the way they are paid typically, if there is a, if there is a, a claim such as this, is he says, I, I want 18% of what you're going to get. Now, that 18% that he's going to take back is going to be a whole lot more than you would have gotten if you had just said to the insurance company, I'm going to take whatever you get. And they have ways of telling you, you only have this, this, and this. And, and I, I listen to my insurance agent and say, well, you know, you really don't, you know, you've got a great policy, but you don't cover this, this, and this, and this, this, and this. And they kept on telling me what it didn't cover. And Jerry said, actually, they made some mistakes in the way it was written. He told the court that, and the court believed it. He got me a whole lot more money than I would have gotten had I just allowed the insurance company to give me what they said they wanted to give me. Um, I have a manuscript policy. I, in fact, I have the same policy that Iron Mountain has. Uh, that's one of the benefits of about having that friendship. Um, my policy duplicates theirs very much, which means that in the event of a fire in my facility, uh, I have restoration coverage for boxes. Now, I have no idea what the equivalent is. Uh, I, I don't think that, that the, the data vault industry, the offsite data protection industry, has, um, I, I don't think we've even had a fire that anybody's going to tell about it anyway. John, do you know one ever? I don't think we ever have. 
you know, the, the real question is going to be is what's going to happen with the first one? That guy's going to be paving the way for, for all of us. And I hate to say that, but that's not the only way we're actually going to find out what's actually going to happen. Um, unless you can sit your agent down with a private adjuster and say, tell me in a very critical way what's going to happen. Here are the critical questions. When this, when this, when the fire happens or something is destroyed, what am I going to get for this? What's my client going to get? In the record storage business, um, there's two ways your client is going to get money. And I believe it's going to be the same way in the day of all two. No, I don't know. I, this is an area I don't know. But I want to tell you about record storage. Um, in, in, um, in, the, in the record storage industry, my policy, and I'll tell you also, our now's policy the very same way. And I don't know if Syntax has the same deal or not. Um, typically, you can only do this when you've got some leverage. And uh, we only had leverage because we went in with our net on this. We use the same agent and everything. Two sets of insurance are going to apply. My, uh, a series of policies I have all the way from um, basically a warehouse legal liability, um, a border, uh, a baby bailer coverage, and I am covering my client for stabilization of the media only, paper or tape, stabilization. Is all I'm required to do. And what I'm trying to do is get that wet box out of the building, get it into a vault, or get wet tape out of the building and get it into a stable environment. And then, after it's stable, I'm going to call the client and say, I've had a problem. But your box is stabilized, but your box is involved, and you're going to need to make a decision. Do you want to recover your tape? Do you want to recover your paper? And if you do, your insurance policy is going to pay for it, not mine. I will, my policy only covers stabilization. Now, the reality is I also have about, I have about $5 million worth of stabilization, I mean, of restoration coverage. But $5 million is not going to cover what's in my building. I've, I've got a million boxes. Folks, it takes about $35, bucks, $35 a cubic foot to freeze dry. That's the entire process. That's take it out of the wet building, uh, put it in a dry box, put it in a freezer trailer, take it to the blast freezer, and and, and blast freeze it for a day and put it in a regular freezer that takes it to 28 degrees. And then we call the client to say, okay, you've got a box in the freezer. You've got to decide whether it's going to be freeze dried or it's going to be destroyed. Only two choices. And if it's going to be freeze dried, then I'm going to send it to Fort Worth, Texas, and we're going to put it in a chamber for two weeks and it's going to be freeze dried. And it's going to come out and I'm going to deliver it to you. And that total is $35 a cubic foot. Now I call it cubic foot 10 to 12 or 15. I think everybody else calls it 1.2, but mine is 1.0. Can I tell you what's going to happen with data tape, data vault? Because I, 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 I didn't have that happen yet. Do you have your contract the timeline that says I'm going to contact you if you have 48 hours to notify me uh, in that, or is that just an agreement no. that you have an understanding you have with your client? No. There is no way you can do that. Okay. Uh, let me tell you why. If you have a million boxes like Iron Mountain did that got wet, there's no way they're going to be able to call anybody in there. Well, let me tell you what we did. That's a better thing to tell you what we did. Okay. Um, the, day, the day after the fire, uh, I, I had some great friends that showed up. You know how you always say, look, if you ever need me, call me? These guys didn't do that. They showed up and they said, what can we do? I had a whole, whole gang of church friends in there. And I put them up and I said, okay. Then I, I gave eight of them a telephone and I said, you're going to call all the people that were not involved, involved in the fire. And then Jane Richards, my wife, Jerry Richards, my nephew, and I, the three Richards called those who were involved in the fire. We wanted Richards doing that. You can't do that every time, but I mean, that was just what our commitment was at the time. And we would call them ourselves and say, we know you were in the building. Your box was in the building. We don't know what's happened with it, but you were in the building. Or we called the others and said, you were not. Yes, you had boxes here, but they were not involved. We let all those eight people do that. That was the very first step. That was June 18, 1998. It was not until October 10. It was not until October 10 that I actually sent everybody, all 230 clients, and said, okay, today is the day I'm telling you, here are the boxes that you had that were involved. It took me from June 18 to October 10 to decide about those 120,000 cubic feet and tell them, here's your list of boxes that are wet, here's your list of boxes that are going to require this, and you've got to decide, but I, and I'm only going to give you like 60 days or 90 days in which to decide what you're going to do with these boxes. Um, I remember it took them a long time, but I, 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 I'm going to give it to them there, folks. They did contact the people and let them know basically the same way we did. And they told us what to do in this case. And it was, it was just, you know, they, they, 
Those who've had fires, I mean, whenever I hear there's a fire in the industry and they're, and they're somebody doesn't like an iron man or whatever, I'm going to call them. I mean, that's just, they need to hear from me. They need to hear there's light at the end of the tunnel. It's not a train, but I need to let them know what's going to happen. Uh, and it needs to come from somebody that's had the fire. Um, let's get back to this insurance. That's, I think that's what you want to hear. I, I can only tell you that we are making a mistake. And I think as a group, there, that if there's anything that we do, you know, there's a lot of things that, that we are all looking at, a lot of vendors that we're looking at. There's one thing that we all have to do, and that's get insurance coverage. And, and that is one thing I would certainly push that we start doing. Is there any way that we can pull this stuff together? And you're going to try and give me all sorts of reasons why I know I've got workman's compensation. We can't do that. Folks, we can. It's called a captive. An insurance captive is where we all pool our money, and rather than... You guys paying yours, and you guys paying yours, and you all paying yours. We're all paying into our own insurance company. We're, we're self-insured up to a certain level, but then a big insurance company is going to insure us after that. And it's, it's going to save us money, but it's also going to give us the coverage of what we're going to be needing. And I, I, I've been working on it since 1994, when I, in 1996. was the first time I worked on a captain with, with at the time, the ACRC, and now prison. Uh, and there's just a lot of resistance. Now, the second thing is, is that a lot of these insurance guys show up and say, we're going to save the day, and all of a sudden they get into it and realize they cannot do it. Uh, I actually have one guy that's with A.J. Gallagher that uh, is out of New York who said, I can do this, I know what to do. He's been studying it for two years, and he actually says he can take all three industries and inform this captain. It's just a one, one, one I think part of the problem is that, that people are concerned about the cost. Yeah, it's going to cost more money. Mm -hmm. I get cheaper from my local agent. I bet you money I'm paying more money than everybody who's doing except Syntax right now. By the way, it's a Syntox, Syntox. 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 Well, they're right. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, and we're self-insured for the first so 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. The golfing bay issue is cost. That's what we've got to get around. What it's going to cost you is when you have the problem. Right. And it, you know, my insurance, I want to say this, my insurance agent was great. I mean, whenever I had a wreck or anything like that, man, he was on the spot. But when it came to a critical issue like this, he was deer in the headlights. He didn't know what to do except pat me on the back, tell me what a great job he's going to do, and then leave. And he never showed up again. Except in court. That's really the next time that we really had a lengthy conversation. They didn't walk away from us. They bragged about giving me a check for fifty thousand dollars a man. I actually brought a camera guy over to take a picture of me getting a fifty thousand dollar check. That was on July or whatever, and I already spent a million bucks. I said, you know, you're bringing me a check for $50,000. That doesn't matter what happened last week. And I, I mean, I, I, I shot, I popped his balloon here because I thought he thought it was going to be a big media event. And it, it, was, it was really insulting to me. Um, I, I guess the, the story that, yeah. Well, I, I'm just going to say, you know, the, we started years ago educating our insurance guys to what we did. And that, in some respects, may have backfired because it scared the crap out of it. Once they find out what you do, so what's his, what's his exposure? The, yeah. I, the idea of the independent adjuster is very important <coughs> to get your insurance guy and the independent adjuster to agree, agree somewhere on on what the, the potential is. You know, your big fear is to have the underwriter walk in the building and say, "Where's this? What's this?" And then all of a sudden, he starts doing the numbers and realizing. What is our exposure? It is astronomical. There's only one company that's writing my coverage uh, in the record storage industry, and that's U.S. I can't think of the name of the company right now. I just won't blame it. And there's only one. There's only one company that's doing it. And they're, they're doing us and I and Melissa are doing you too. You know who you've got? Fireman's. Who? Fireman's. No, Fireman's didn't, they didn't write our coverage. They wouldn't, unless they changed in the past year. There's only one company. Part, no, it's not USA. It's, no, it's somebody you've never heard of, like USA or US World or whatever it is. It's restoration coverage, and it's a manuscript policy. But there's only one company that was writing it. Because um, it was very hard for other people to quote us because they all had to go to the same company to get this very same policy. And it's, and we, have a, we have a coverage that says very specifically what's going to happen. Um, the restoration of the box. Um, uh, stabilization of the box, we have all that in, in a very lengthy paragraph. Just yes. real quick, in a previous life, when I ran away from home one time to the big city in the south, but uh, the first job I had as GM there was they handed me a, a, a three ring binder and it was titled the H2O book. And they did not have a fire in their vault, but they had three feet of water. Uh, and so anything on the bottom three levels was floating when they came in on the Monday yeah. morning. And it was about 800 pages. Uh, and to your point about communication, 
um, you know, we immediately get there before I got there, but they immediately did the right thing and contacted BMS, who you were right, was wonderful to work with. Outrageously priced, but you know, when you're desperate, it doesn't matter. And uh, we got them free, frozen, and then it became up to the clients. But that communication was not done whatsoever until it was 90 days when I showed up on the scene and said, here's the book, you need to figure out what to do with this. And I started calling these people one by one. And most of the attitude was not anger about what happened because most of this stuff was backups of backups of backups. So it was more just <coughs> replace the tape. But it was a fact nobody had, had picked up the phone. You know, most of the things, I know you got a question. One of the things that, that I think the, the thing that, that I would say is going to be the biggest problem it's not going to be from a record center standpoint, it's going to be from a client standpoint. And that is, they're in an office building with a multi floor, and what's going to likely to happen to them is that the coffee pot on the floor above, or the commode on the floor above, will start running on Friday night, and by the, when they come in on some Monday morning, everything will be wet. And uh, that's the real issue. If you, can, if you can get them in that dialogue where they start realizing that there is a possibility that they'll have records damaged in their office, and it's really easy to take that and focus it back to the record center or to the data vault. Because you need to get them thinking about what is the possibility here? And in a, especially in the computer rooms, it's not so much that's going to happen in our place. Chances are unlikely to happen there. It's more than likely it's going to happen in their place. Some workman walking through with a, with a ladder hit a sprinkler head, and all of a sudden you've got 60,000 gallons of water coming out for the next 45 minutes. You know, tell them where, where, where do you, and you know, every one of my employees know where you go out and turn off the water. We have, we have, we have a 251,000 square foot record center. And I have a whole bunch of places to turn off water. We have several garages, but everyone of my employees know where they are. Uh, that's, do y'all know where they, where you're from? And I'm asking that report. My point is, is that you need, that's one of the things that, that, that we just, we learned after that fire. But I'm trying to tell people, I'm trying to tell people in the offices, if the water's running in the, the in Denny Crane's office, who's going to raise hell with you? Uh, how are you going to, you know, what are you going to do to save the day? Because in a lot of cases, um, th after the records are wet, they're going to be looking to you to take care of it. Now, we try to, we, we really do try to instruct people that are records managers in offices about what to do in the, in the event of a disaster that has to do with records. Because they're going to be looking at us. And we know what to do. We tell them what to do. Uh, yeah. My question was about insurance coverage. Did you have a business continuity policy? Yes. And did it apply? Yeah. And here, and, uh, let me answer. I think um, we had um, another policy that was going to deal with revenue. How much revenue do you lose because this box burned? Here's the funny story. Um, we had 11 years. That's all we got on that. And, and I was making what? Why 11 years? My Lord, I've been in business now since 87. Here it's 98. Look how much de destruction I've done in that amount of time. Very little. The likelihood is that these boxes are going to be here forever. And I want you to know the ching, 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 ching started going off. And now it's they're going to pay me revenue for three months. That's what they reduce it to. That same way. And I don't know what you guys got unless you guys have got looked at the numbers yet. But you need to look at what your insurance policy, how much revenue you're going to get in the event there is a fire, and that data is to storage. You've just lost revenue. There is a policy that will pay you for loss of revenue. And what, what's it called, Chad? It's not business continuity. Loss it's business. Income. It's what? Loss, loss of income. income. Yeah. Is that it? That is. That is it. Uh, that is. That is one of the policies that go in there. Get to plead and plead, browbeat, and argue and bid. Yep, you really do. Right. Now, uh, if you'll do this, if. Uh, I don't know if you want to do this or not. Um, I will give you a white paper that was written by, you know, I told you this lady with Iron Mountain that, that helped me out greatly. She left Iron Mountain right after that. And Prism heard about her through me, and they hired her to write a white paper on insurance coverages necessary for a record center. If, if you'll give me that, uh, uh, Prism actually sold it for a while, and they're not selling it anymore, so it's on the market. If you want that, I'll be happy to give it to you. I will tell you that, that uh, it's basically what the, the, the Bible that my insurance agent used to, to write the policy that we have. Now, the question is going to be, is it going to be applicable to, uh, to uh, um, forget which, which conference am I at here? <laughs> this is, this is off-site data protection. Um, I was getting ready to say shredding here. What yes, was the name of the, uh, you call it manuscript restoration? 
So manuscript policy is what it is. What that means is they've written specific language to cover. It's not a boilerplate. You don't want boilerplate. You want specific language that says, in the event of a problem, you're going to pay for this. And um, I, I'm, I'm sitting here trying to think. You know, Gallagher would probably allow me to share that. Again, we're talking about a record setting, but it applies to a data vault. Well, because it's not long tail storage, that really there's no guarantee that you would have a given tape for more than three months anyway. So if it was destroyed, a new version of the tape would come in. It depends on what type of receipt Marvin shape you have. But, but, but if, if you, you store a lot of tapes like Marvin stores, which is sort of long term storage, you might want to protect that. But the majority of the business that we do in Sydney is rotational stuff. So That's not my business. My business is archival more than anything. You know, I've got, I told you I've got that bank vault. Yeah. Guys, I, I mean, you got to, I mean, John's going to know that my clients are Sony. The regulatory quiet or environment right now is producing a lot of archival tapes. But most of my business is music. You know, I mean, there's a lot of digital out there, but folks, I've got, I, I, I've been told I have Elvis, Elvis Presley originals in there. I said, Curve records? They're one of my clients. Were they yours? <laughs> He's no longer in the business. Now, Kurt is my client. Yes, I did leave Iron Man, but came back. They were very, very unhappy. Yeah, Kurt came to us. So, um, I suppose the depending on what sort of business what sort of business you were doing, you would need to, to consider it differently. But if you're doing the archival stuff, you would need yes. to protect your income. But see, that's, that's what, that is what, but see, we can't protect our, we can't protect our income. It used to be 11 years, I, so that's what it was when we had the fire. But they quickly brought that back. USA, no. I was trying to think of the name of that company. Um, it, it was Fireman's Fund that we had for a couple of years. Um, and then it went to another company, and then it centered on this one company that's had it for about the past nine years. But they, they write this uh, restoration policy for us. And guys, that's paper. That's mostly what we're talking about there. So it's probably not going to apply to you. In fact, I don't know. I, I really can't tell you. you. You don't know these things, really, until you have the first disaster, and then... Then you learn all of the lessons you're going to learn very quickly, yes. In your service agreement or in your contract, you have some limitation of liability. Is that, did that come you into know, play at all? You know, it, um, that's, that's what the way the insurance company attacked me. They said, well, you know, the, the, the contract that you have oh, is only going to cover $2 per box. I said, yeah, that's if the box is destroyed, but this box isn't destroyed. It's wet. Mm. And there was no nothing in there. Well, let, let me tell you, I still have that very same contract that I had before the fire today, and the insurance company that we have now said, we don't care what, it's, what, that, what that contract says there. Yeah, if it burns, you'll get two, they'll get $2 a box, but um, our, that's why you have the manuscript policy that says here is exactly what we're going to do in the event the box is wet, or the box is smoke damaged. Now, there's no equivalent really in the, in the vault. Do, is there? do you have permanent out fees for your types of curiosity? Yes, I do. <laughs> Not as high as yours, but I do that. <laughs> Just, of the people who do tape here, who has permanent out fees for tape? Why are you asking? Well, I'm just thinking that presumably your insurance should at least cover the equivalent of the permanent out fee for the box because that was the only income you had guaranteed. Well, but with tape, if none of us have permanent out fees, then really... Well, let me see. My permanent, my permanent removal fee is not a, a hostage fee. There are more... You know, my, my removal is going to cost more than just re requesting a tape. And, and I'm going to do a whole lot of things for them. I'm going to cover that. And it's not outrageous. Uh, and, and I outline very clearly. Here's what I'm going to do in the event these, these tape leave, never to come back. If it's a onesie twosie thing, it's very small. If it's, if it's everything, it's going to take me more time, more people. I can't hire temps. It's going to have to be done after hours. Of it. It's going to cost me more money. And I tell them that very clearly. So and there's been no objection. How do you... Um if you have a permanent outfit, because obviously most of us don't have, have that here, or an equivalent of, mm -hmm. how do you protect yourself from someone, say, declaring a disaster, requesting all of their dates back, and then never giving them back? That's right. never happened, so I don't know. Um, it, it, it could happen. So you wouldn't, there's no threshold that if they, they bring back a certain amount, they have to pay 
a guarantee on the permanent outfit or anything? We have never, let me, let me go back here. I don't have the business that you have. I, I don't think, I'm probably like too many people here. My business is, is in a case only. I don't slot anything. Most of the clients that I have are music business, and they're two inch tape, 15, uh, 15 by 15. I mean, it's a lot of reels. All, all kinds of formats. But mine is mostly archival. Now, I do rotate a lot of backup tape, but when I do that, it's mostly a weekly. I don't do daily. I don't do very many dailies. It's mostly in case, and I, I'm going to walk in the cases like those things back there. I'll rotate the tape out a week. That's so my business is not like it. Actually, my business is more like the record storage business, you know, the way that, that it's operated. Uh, maybe, that's a, uh, that's, maybe that's not a good way to say it. I, I just look at it because we have pickups and deliveries. But in, your case, like but in your case, you're storing tape masters. Yes. For the, for the records. Mostly. And, and that's a higher liability because that's the master tape. And that, that's something that you probably ought to look at very carefully. I don't know what the answer is, but you got a different situation. Yeah, I do. Well, this is something that we have struggled with from the standpoint of even potential fraud from the client. Because in your service agreement, it says we're only going to pay, you know, X for a lost tape or damaged tape. I'm not going to pay replacement or restoration. We said that. Because how do you quantify what replacement or restoration of data is? How do you say it's going to, you know, they could say this was a one-of-a-kind master. You know, it's priceless. Or this is going to cost me a hundred million dollars. I mean, seriously, to restore. And we continually grapple with this. And being in Houston with larger, you know, a lot of large corporations, they always try to pick away that limitation of liability. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we continually grapple with. You know, we want more insurance. Yeah. We want this. We want that. Well, I cannot recreate an Elvis Presley recorded session. That's impossible. So what's the value of that tape? The better thing to do is you better have a very good duplicate of it somewhere else. And yeah, we've got the archive, and you've been in my vault, and, and you've approved it, and, and you're paying the rates, and you've got the you know, So we've done all the things on the front end to, to make sure that they're, they're happy with that. See, how much did your expense for your new policy, how much higher is it going to purchase? Ten, um, but, um, well, it's 40000 and now it's about 120000 But I can sleep very well. <laughs> I'm paying a lot of money. Because right. you, you, you went through litigation in the end. Did you cover that the litigation you went through to get it? Did, did, sorry, so. That's okay. Did, go ahead. Well, I'm just curious what toll that lit litigation had on you personally. The, the toll. Well, my, my board of directors said, you need to drop this. And when you look at how much sales we had in that period of that seven years, uh, it took a real toll on the company. Rhett was one of my best friends, and I'm not sure what he'd tell you. I, you know, I, I, I had some pretty down times because they hit you with stuff. And they changed one of their tricks. Uh, uh, they, they went through four attorneys, they went through four law firms. They'd drop a law firm, and the new law firm would come in and they'd say, well, we want these things. I said, well, they've got it. they said, no, you've got to give them to us again. I said, holy crap, it took me two months to come up with that stuff. I went through that four times. And finally, I mean, then on the second time, we kept copies of everything. So very quick, we'd send them off. You want them scanned or how do you want them? I mean, we did, we did that. It took a toll on you. And we look at my sales during that period. You know, I told you I was growing in a period of 100% five years in a row there for a while. Um, boy, I flatlined at that point. I still grew. And, our, and the funny thing is our revenue was stable at that time. We lost uh, five clients to Iron Mountain. That was right when the consolidation was happening. Um, you know, the, the roll-up was happening with Iron Mountain. And we, we lost a quarter of a million boxes to Iron Mountain just through contracts being signed in California, New York, Chicago, other places in Atlanta. And a quarter of a million boxes went out at that time. They also paid me a permanent removal during that time. So, you know, that money was needed very much. So I can't lose those boxes. But, uh, so, so having gone through that, is the only way that you've protected yourself theoretically from future litigation having a better case in the future? Because, you know, insurance companies don't like to pay. So you could now have a much better insurance policy. But then when it comes time to claim, have the insurer do the same thing to you. Sure. Do you mean my insurance agent? Yeah. Well, no, I see, I've got Jerry Brasher who checks every day on the policy I come out with. He looks at everything and, and he says you've got what you think you have. 
Every year we go through this process with him. That's number one. Number two, um, I had a meeting with a client yesterday morning, brand new client. Um, I, I, I sit down with him and, I, and for a full hour I tell him how to do business with us. But one of the things I tell him is you've got to do four things. Number one is you've got to call your insurance agent right now and tell them that you're going to be handling your, your records are going to be sorted, Richard and Richard. That gives them the ability to walk over to my building, come in and look at me, and to approve you. Number two is um, uh, you've got to make sure that you have got a valuable papers protection policy. Number three, you've got to make sure that you have, if you don't have it, you've got to get it. Uh, number three, I want to know what your uh, limits are, and you've got to make sure that that's going to cover you. And number four is what's your deductible. I go through that with everybody, and then they sign off on it that we have discussed that. So I, I'm on the front end, I'm telling you those things. If you leave me during this time here, as a permanent, I'm, I'm going through everything that I do for my process. And they sign off on it. They understand these things. And that's just, it's, we, we call them, uh, uh, we, we have a form that, that we fill out. But I go over that with everybody. And along with everything else, I'm going to tell them how, how to give me a new box, how to give me a tape. Go through that whole process. And, uh, it's a lengthy process that we go through, but we, we learned that from the fire. You know, they need to be informed as to what it is, uh, that, 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 that their responsibilities are to us. But those four things that I do about the insurance, um, I'm encouraging them to, to get, bring the insurance company that they have into this process. I want them to come and look at my facility. Heck, I, you know, I'm, I'm easy with that. But, um, because if he has a problem, they shouldn't store with me. They should go somewhere else. Hadn't happened, but I mean, they have that opportunity. Guys, I don't have it. I'm, I'm just freewheeling in here right now. Um, and I'm really holding you much longer than we were supposed to. I think you said 15, 20 minutes was a bit of an hour already. Um, I, my apologies. Um, I, I, last thing I want to leave you with, please, if you get nothing else out of this, I would honestly look at hiring a private adjuster. And if you don't have one, there, there are so many private adjusting companies that, that you're going to find them. But the problem you're going to have if you do that, you've got to bring him up to speed on what is record storage. What is off-site data protection? What is shred? Uh, whereas I, I still think we ought to use one guy. If it's not Jerry Brasher, fine. But we all ought to be using one guy so that he's doing it 50 times a year rather than two times a year. Thank you all very much.